Uh, we'll be there in just a moment. And I uh, wanted to just uh, reemphasize today that we are starting our Catch the Vision series. If you're new to Homewood or uh, wanting to know more about Homewood, this is a great opportunity. Once a quarter, we do a four-week series during class time right after worship. And I have the privilege of teaching that today on our mission and vision. That'll be uh, right out uh, this hallway to the elevators, the room uh, right upstairs next to the elevator. So would invite you to be a part of that if you've not done that already. Well, according to Wallet Hub, a website, uh, there is a strategic formula in determining the most sinful cities in the United States. Uh, so what they do is they take uh, various data points and they plug them into a, a system and throughout that system they determine a point system that's assigned to specific cities and you can determine how sinful that city is. Some of the data includes violent crimes per capita. Some of the, bio, uh, the data includes excessive drinking statistics. Some of the data includes adult entertainment establishments per capita, as well as other factors like lowest charitable donations per income percentage uh, within a city, uh, even measuring vanity by measuring the number of tanning salons per capita in a city. So they take all of this information and put it together and, and out pops the most sinful cities in America. You could probably guess the number one most sinful city in our country. Uh, it's probably no surprise that it's Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, but would you be able to guess who is number 65 on this list? Yes, yours truly, Birmingham, Alabama is the 65th most sinful city in America according to this survey and statistics. So it's one thing to be considered a sinful city. But what if your city was considered Satan's hometown, the place where Satan lives? As we continue our series seven this morning, going through the seven messages to the seven churches in the book of Revelation, and ultimately, I believe, messages to the church today, uh, we come to this church at Pergamum, where Jesus says, this is Satan's hometown. This is the city where Satan himself lives. And so if you have your Bibles, I want you to uh, join in, in this reading. Uh, I'll read it, but I, I want you to just let it meditate within you as we continue on. Verse 12, chapter 2. To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, These are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. Now let's pause right there. Because all of these messages, what we've seen the past few weeks as we've been going through this series, is all these messages begin with this introduction to the angel of the church. Now in the original translation, that word is angelos, or angelo, and what it means is messenger. And so as we look in the Bible, what we see is that there are certainly non-human being messengers known as angels. Uh, but one thing I would suggest as we're reading this is that that word messenger can also apply uh, to a human being. And so what I believe is that uh, the, the letter, the message is being written to a messenger of a local church. So someone who is a primary communicator, someone who is a leader of that church that, that gets up in front of the church and, and speaks, uh, a messenger. So uh, I could technically be uh, Angel Brett, all right? I know you're expecting so much more, but, but this, is, this is the message you're definition of this word. And I think that's helpful for us because sometimes we say, well, what is it? Does every church have an angel? Well, in one sense, if you're a messenger, yes. Verse 13, I know where you live. Here it is, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city. Here it is, where Satan lives. So Pergamum is the capital 
of one of the provinces of Asia, Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey. You'll see a map on the screen. I've shown this every week just to kind of remind us of where these churches are located. You'll see number three is uh, Pergamos, which is the Greek term, Pergamum Latin. But, but here's where th it all happened in modern day Turkey. You'll see Patmos where the apostle John, the last living disciple of Jesus is, is writing these messages to these churches. And, and Pergamum is an interesting city. Uh, today, it's one of the best excavated cities in all of the ancient Roman world. Uh, a few weeks ago, I got to visit a bookstore known as Powell's Bookstore. It's in Portland, Oregon. You'll see a picture of me right there in front of Powell's Bookstore. The largest bookstore in the world houses a million books. The reason I show you this is because when we think of Pergamum, Pergamum actually had one of the largest bookstores, one of the largest libraries in the ancient world. Matter of fact, its library housed about 200,000 scrolls or books. It was second only to Alexandria, which was in Egypt, that housed about 400,000 scrolls or books. Another amazing scene in Pergamum was the Hellenistic theater. You should have a picture of that on the screen. You can see how it takes up this whole hillside. It would seat close to 10,000 people. An amazing form of just entertainment in the city. And when you went to, if you go to Pergamum today, you'd also see some other things as, as well. There's many uh, altars there that are attributed to major deities of the day. You had uh, various temples there that recognized each of these gods, lowercase g, and uh, it was like the Hollywood of the day with all of these gods there. And so the altar of Zeus was represented here in Pergamum. The king of Mount Olympus, this was this picture of power and, and who Zeus was, and folks would go to this altar. You had the temple of Dionysus, the god of wine and revelry. This place was like Vegas, as we mentioned a few moments ago. Uh, what happened at TOD, the Temple of Dionysus stayed at TOD. Um, but there was, there was wine and excessive drinking, and that would lead to uh, all kinds of immorality and things that happened in this location. Not only that, but if you were looking for the god of food, you could find the god of food or the goddess of food, the goddess Demeter. If you were sick, you could go to the temple of Asclepius. You'll see a picture of Asclepius on the screen. People would come from all over, and this temple was the temple of healing. This is actually, the healing was not done by uh, the physicians or the priests. The healing was believed to be done by the snakes. And so the priest would put you in a trance, and they would... Ship, ship you over here to this dark room and then they would release the snakes and the snakes would crawl all over your bodies and that's what was believed to be the healing agent in your life. The creep factor just went way up in the room. But this is what was happening in Pergamum. Matter of fact, the symbol for medicine today is still the snake around the rod. We still see that. It dates all the way back to Pergamum. That's where we got that from. And so before we rush to saying, you know what, I'm thankful that we're not like this culture because this is where Jesus says the devil's throne was. But let's stop and think about what was going on in Pergamum. What culture are we talking about? A culture that was fixated on knowledge a culture that was fixated on entertainment, a culture that was fixated on wine and sex and modern medicine. Makes us stop and think for a moment of maybe there are some similarities to the culture that we find ourselves in today. Jesus says, I know where you live. It's where the enemy holds court. But Jesus commends the church at Pergamum for their faithfulness. He begins by this commendation to the church. And in particular, he remembers a faithful witness whose name was Antipas. 
Now, where else do we see Antipas in Scripture? Anybody know? That's right, nowhere. This is the only time that Antipas is mentioned. Nobody knows anything about Antipas. But Jesus knew him. And Jesus called him my faithful witness. Oh, to have that label. And he was put to death for it. More than likely put to death by the local government for his faith in Jesus. If someone in this room, take a look around this room at your brothers and sisters. If someone in this room was put to death this week by our local government because they believed in Jesus, would you think twice before you came and stepped foot in this room next week? My guess is many of us would. Matter of fact, we'd probably say, well, that live stream sounds pretty good about <laughs> right about now, all right? Jesus recognizes Antipas as, as my faithful witness. And, and I just want to remind you, I want to encourage us today, church, that if you feel like no one sees me, no one appreciates me. Maybe you're listening to this in our, our nursery, you know, and you're serving by rocking babies and taking care of them. Maybe you're serving up in our tech arts booth. Maybe you're teaching a class or preparing coffee and, and biscuits for folks, and you think to yourself, no one sees me, no one appreciates me. Whatever that thing is, maybe you're faithful in prayer and no one you know, sees you in your prayer closet praying each and every week for you know, the goings-ons of, of this community and this church and, and you're faithful to that and you think no one sees me, no one appreciates me. I, I want to remind you, church, Jesus sees you. Jesus appreciates you. And I would much rather be known at the end of my life as a faithful witness of Jesus than to be known for anything else. Antipas, my faithful witness, Jesus says. So I want to ask us a couple questions as we reflect on this message to the church in Pergamum. And if you're jotting down notes today, I would encourage you to jot down these questions and continue to reflect on these as you read this text and as you go through this study. Hopefully you grabbed one of the journals on the way in today where you can do that even more easily. And the question is this, are you considered a faithful witness of Jesus? You stop and answer that question in your own mind. Are you considered a faithful witness of Jesus? And if not, what in your life needs to change? And that word witness is the word uh, martis. It's where we get the word martyr. Someone who you know, dies uh, for their faith. And, and this is the same description that is applied to Jesus. If you're looking there in Revelation 2, if you go back to Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, Jesus is called what? Jesus is called a faithful witness, a faithful martis. And so isn't it an interesting picture that, that Jesus is a faithful witness to God the Father and Antipas is a faithful witness to Jesus? And our call as well is to be a faithful witness to Jesus at the end of life's journey. Do I want to be known by others or do I want to be known by Jesus? Look at verse 14. Nevertheless, Jesus says, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin, that they ate food, sacrificed to idols, and committed sexual immorality. Verse 15, likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Now you'll find the story of Balaam and Balak all the way back in our Old Testament, Numbers 22 through 25. And you can read those three chapters uh, today or this week and get some more context. But, but basically what's happening is Balak 
is the king of Moab, and he asked Balaam to come and curse the, the, some of the Israelites that are, are coming and infringing upon you know, his territory. But Balaam, kind of a prophet of sorts, says, no, I, I'm not going to say anything unless the Lord tells me to say something. So here's, here's Balaam, you know, I, I'm not going to, you're wanting me to come and curse you know, these people. I'm not going to curse these people uh, because I've asked the Lord about it. And when I continue to ask the Lord about it, he says, you can't curse somebody who's already blessed. And so I'm not going to do that, even, even though that Balak is offering him a pretty good reward, pretty good money for this. He says, uh-uh, not going to do it. And so you may remember the story of Balaam and his donkey. And so Balaam decides to go and visit, or he's told to go and visit the, the officials, the, the Moabite officials. And so he gets his donkey. He's, he's walking down the road. And as he's walking down the road, there's a, an angel in the road with a sword. But Balaam can't see it, but Balaam's donkey can. And so Balaam's donkey veers off the side of the road. And what does Balaam do? He beats the donkey. Well, then they get going again, and then Balaam's donkey runs Balaam into a wall. And what does Balaam do? Beats the donkey. Then finally, Balaam's donkey just lays down right at the feet of Balaam. And what does Balaam do? Beats the donkey. And finally, one of the craziest stories in all of Scripture, the donkey, the Lord opens the donkey's mouth and the donkey turns around and says, why are you beating me? But that's not the craziest part to me. The craziest part to me is that Balaam responds. <laughs> what does Balaam say? You know? He says, if I had a sword, I'd kill you right now. And then, and then the Lord opens up Balaam's eyes. And then Balaam sees the angel. And it's like, oh. He bows before the angel saying, I have sinned. Crazy story. But what we learn about Balaam is that Balaam, although described as this very faithful witness, I'm not going to say anything unless the Lord tells me. I'm not going to say anything unless the Lord tells me. I'm not going to say anything unless the Lord tells me. We read in Numbers chapter 25 that the Israelites begin to engage in sexual activity outside of marriage with the Moabite women. And they begin to eat food that was sacrificed to idols, to other gods. But here's the sad part. In Numbers chapter 31, verse 16, we learn that it was Balaam that enticed them to do that. And so Jesus is recalling this. And he is telling the church in Pergamum about this story, the story of compromise. So here's question number two. What have you compromised that has not honored Christ? Now, you may have not persuaded a whole nation to engage in sexual immorality, or you may not have persuaded a whole nation to eat food that's being sacrificed to false gods. You may have not done that, but how do we compromise? What are the things that we do in our life that compromise our relationship with Christ? Oh, I'll, I'll just watch this rated R movie. It's not going to, I'm old enough, big enough to handle it. It's not going to feed anything into my mind that's that I can't handle, is that drawing you closer to Christ? I'm going to engage in excessive drinking because it, it, doesn't, it doesn't bother anybody. It's just something I can do. Does that draw you closer to Christ? I'm going to engage in, in sex outside of the marriage covenant because it's not hurting anybody. It, does that draw you closer to Christ? I'm going to gossip about people in my workplace and I'm going to say things about them behind their back. That's not, is that hurting anybody? Is that drawing you closer to Christ? I'm going to tell this racially charged joke or this slur, or I'm going to laugh at somebody else who does. Is that drawing you closer to Christ? <laughs> what 
have you and I compromised in our lives that has not brought honor and glory to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? This is a hard message, folks. I'm not going to stand up here and act like it's not. But church, I need you to know that Jesus hates compromise. And you say, that's a strong word, preacher. It's not my word. That's the word that he uses earlier in this chapter when he talks about the Nicolaitans. What does he say to the church at Ephesus? He says, you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I, Jesus, also hate. The name Pergamum means, it means thoroughly married. And the church at Pergamum was thoroughly married to the world. And Satan couldn't win this church from the outside. He couldn't bring an outside attack on the church. So how did he attack this church? He attacks them from the inside. Brilliant strategy. Because when you attack from the inside, you can oftentimes do much more damage than from coming from the outside. And so Satan attacks this church through through compromise from within. And here's three reasons that the enemy loves compromise. These won't be on the screen, but I just want to share these with you. Three reasons that the enemy loves compromise. Number one is that it rarely occurs quickly, so you hardly notice the change. You rarely, it rarely occurs quickly, compromise does. It's a slow fade. And so you hardly even recognize the change. Number two is that it always lowers the original standards that you may once have held important. So compromise is going to lower anything that you once may have held important. It's going to lower that standard. And number three is that it's seldom offensive because it's perceived as loving. Compromise can sometimes be perceived as loving. But when it's drawing us further away from our relationship with Jesus, is that really loving? So it's been said that what one generation tolerates, the next generation will accept. And what that generation accepts, the next generation will celebrate. And then Jesus says there's only one antidote to compromise. There's only one thing, one antidote. What does he say in verse 16? Repent, therefore. Otherwise, I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Church, I can think of no sadder image in all of the Bible as it relates to the Christian community than Jesus Christ fighting his church. And what's his weapon? His word. This is the sword that he uses. And so our last question that I want us to reflect on, one that I've reflected on myself this week, is will we be a church who compromises? Or will we be a church who holds to the promises of our coming king. Verse 17, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. So let's close with these three truths, and I need you to hear these before we close. I need you to. Because in these three truths, in this verse 17, I believe we find a directive, a direction for where Christ is calling his church to head. He says that you'll, you'll receive this hidden 
manna. And so the first thing I want us to be reminded of is that Christ will nourish us. The manna in the Old Testament was this physical food that was supplied for the Israelites daily. But Jesus offers the spiritual food that we need daily. It's Christ who nourishes us. It's Christ who feeds us. Matter of fact, he's called the what? The bread of life. Number two is that Christ will receive us. So Jesus says he will give the victor a white stone. Scholars say that there's over a dozen ways that this could be interpreted. There's so many ways that that could be referring to something. Stone as an acquittal at a trial or stone of acceptance at a banquet. There's so many things in that context of that day of what that could mean. But, but it's a gift from Jesus. And what is that gift? That gift is the gospel. It's the good news that Jesus has paid our sin debt, our penalty. Christ will nourish us. He will receive us. And here's the last thing. Christ will acknowledge us. Christ says that that stone has a new name written on it. And to be given a new name was a new status, a mark of genuine membership into the community of the redeemed. So what what does a faithful life look like? It looks like Jesus. We would do well, church, that as we reflect on this difficult text, and I I wish I could say that this series was going to get easier, (laughs) but it's not. But as we reflect on this text and we reflect on the words of Jesus and we think about man, I want to be an Antipas. I want Jesus to look at me and I want him to say, ah, my faithful witness. Let's pray together. Father, I'm thankful that all of your scripture is God-breathed. I'm thankful that it's useful. And Father, I pray today as we reflect on this difficult text that we will be reminded that we have a faithful Lord and King, and his name is Jesus. I pray that we will take seriously Jesus' call to, to therefore repent. And as Jesus said, repent because the kingdom of heaven is near. Uh, We can truly do that because Jesus has drawn near to us so we can be empowered to know that we can change. Not by our own power, not by our own might, but because the Holy Spirit can do that heart work inside of us. And we pray for that change today, God, that you'll transform our hearts, that you'll make us into what you've called us to be, your faithful witnesses, your faithful martyrs. God, I'm grateful for this church. I'm thankful for these brothers and sisters that I get to walk alongside and who have shaped me and formed me in deep ways. I pray that we will faithfully walk together as we journey toward your throne. And it's your throne of grace. It's in Jesus I pray. Amen. Church, I'm going to ask you to be standing, and there'll be a shepherd down front and a shepherd and a couple back in this room. If you have a need this morning, please go see one of them or come down and see me. Let's sing. Let us be faithful, faithful.